Hi, this is Eric Anderson with John Broughton on Retrospectives on 3SER Casey Radio. And on a personal note, John, I just want to congratulate you on your 20th year of uh, fine radio programming. And uh, I want to thank you personally for playing my music over all these years. I really appreciate it. Take it to heart. Just to cover a bit of history first, when did when were you first bitten by the music bug? When, when did uh, you know that that's what you wanted to do? I was probably in my, I was a teenager, maybe around, well, maybe younger, 10, 10 11, 12, 13, around that time. And I was uh, 13, I went and saw Elvis Presley play in my hometown, Buffalo, New York. And um, sat there with the audience for about two seconds until he started playing three chords and everybody was on their feet and the chairs were destroyed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he was flashing around the stage in his gold suit and he was with that great band with Scotty Moore and Bill Black and J.D. Fontaine. Now, before New York, I believe you were performing over on the West Coast. What what sort of uh, folk scene was happening over there in the 60s? We don't hear as much about that as, as what we hear. Okay, that's an interesting question. Um, a lot of people, I think... Um, who were interested in music, like this was like, this is the nascent, like the folk revival, or you might call the folk, re- urban urban folk revival, or mm-hmm. the singer-songwriter movement. There wasn't any then. Um, a lot of people gravitated with their instruments to New York City to meet people like the Weavers, Pete Seeger, and Woody Guthrie. As case in point is Bob Dylan, or Phil Oaks. These are singer-songwriters. I was very interested in meeting the Beats, the writers, uh, like Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac and people like that, Neil Cassidy. And I, so I gravitated to the West Coast, and I did meet these writers, which is illustrated in uh, this chronicle I wrote called Beat Avenue. Mm-hmm. And uh, then in a club in North Beach, which is, a, which is kind of the Greenwich Village of uh, the Bohemian section of San Francisco. Um, in a coffee house where the, there were people, a lot of, there's a lot of acoustic music happening in these coffee houses, people getting up on stage and playing. Um, Tom Paxson, the songwriter, found me. And then that's when I went to New York. And I got there around 1964. And I became a part of this first wave of singer songwriters. This was the birth of the singer songwriter movement at Greenwich Village. Before that, there were songwriters, but other people sang the songs. And the songs were usually short. They were designed for entertainment purposes, for like the radio, for jukeboxes, the beach, you know. But these songs were, with the advent of the long playing record, we uh, could write longer songs. And in this, these few short years, in the early 60s, was the birth of the singer-songwriter movement. And I guess there's more singer-songwriters now in the world than there are sharks in the sea. <laughs> Certainly, yeah. Uh... When you arrived in New York, did you find it a very welcoming music fraternity? Yeah, I, I was very welcoming. Uh, I was a little nervous uh, um, because this wasn't really, the singer-songwriting thing was not necessarily like a folk revival thing. It wasn't like a bunch of white people trying to play like black people or like mountain people or country people. This was a special movement where people were creating their own realities, um, dictating their own fates in terms of what they wrote. Their destinies were through their pen and their guitars. So it was a special, very small cluster of people, very small thing. And uh, But I was very warmly received. Tom Paxson gave me an apartment to live in, his apartment. He was moved, he had moved out to Long Island. And uh, Phil Oakes was a, t- just took me by the hand and led me around to all the clubs and introduced me to all the people. People like Dave Von Ronk and Patrick Skye, Bob Dylan, um, Peter Lafarge. The people at Broadside Magazine who were the first to print these uh, early songs. So yeah, I was very. People were very nice to me. Would have been David a, Blue. You would have been in a position there to to witness some wonderful performance, and in particular, some great old blues artists that were uh, more or less rediscovered during that that time. Oh yeah, in fact, some there, some are. Yeah, they they were like Mississippi John. Her people that were just, I mean, I think performing would be the fur- furthest things from their minds. People like Book of White or Mississippi John Hurt. Um, uh, even you know, even Lightning Hopkins and Muddy Waters got rescued by the, this ur- this college urban blues, you know, folk revival. It, it was like a whole uh, injection of energy into their careers, like BB King, even you know, yeah, Muddy Waters. The Rolling Stones helped too. They helped them, you know. 
people like Fred McDowell, and, uh, Sonny Boy Williamson, they were discovered. By, but see, when I when I was, was there first, I mean, I, I kind of cut my eye teeth on listening to these people because when I was there in the village, I didn't, I didn't have a lot of dough. So I was like, you know, traipsing around the streets and going to these clubs. And in those days, the performers played for six days a week. So it was like, if you played a gig, you went in there for a week. You almost lived in the city. Mm. wherever you went and this was true not just of uh, uh, blues singers and people like that it was true of Miles Davis Charlie Mingus uh, John Coltrane you'd move into a city for a week and almost live there you became a member of the community you know so when I was in New York and I didn't have much work I wasn't going out of town I just could be in the streets and I'd listen for a week straight of like Sun House or a week straight of Lightning Hopkins Muddy Waters Charlie Mingus so that's how I learned how to play music uh, that's how I learned to get good did they? Did you learn a lot from them in terms of how to, how to work an audience and things like that as well? Well, I think you you've got the hypnotic effect of uh, of uh, how you how you can kind of get your guitar or drone or if you will um, with uh, and weave it with uh, the, the, with the words, the, the, the poetry, the narrative. You put the two together, and you can you know you can hypnotize people. You didn't you didn't need bass drums and uh, a, a Telecaster guitar. Yeah. It was uh, happening all in the mind, like a bedtime story, you know? Mm -hmm. And there was all kinds of writing going on then. It was an exciting time. I mean, people, Phil Oaks criticized me once because I wrote a song called Violets of Dawn, and the only criticism was it was too short. <laughs> <laughs> too short. <laughs> he yelled at me. So I had to go back and write another verse till he was happy, you know, because he was like an older brother to me. And there were people there like Fred Neal. Tim Harden, you ever heard of them? Yeah, great writers. Yeah, and I'm doing a whole album of their material. I'm doing an album in in, uh, in December. That's uh, I'm recording people in the streets that I knew, everybody that I knew on the streets. Bleaker McDougal, West Third Street, which would uh, be the songs of you know Tim Buckley, Tim Harden, Fred Neal, Peter Lafarge, Bob Dylan, Tom Paxton. Phillips, and it's not a nostalgia album. It's actually to try to create an album to point out that this music, has, since it gave birth to the singer-songwriter movement, it also is a whole entire canon, a roots canon of music, mm. like ragtime, jazz, blues, Chicago blues, you know, fiddle tunes, square dancing music, Texas blues. You know, I mean, it's like it's its own genre, so I'm presenting it. It's kind of going to be looked at that way, not just as some kind of walk down memory, memory lane. Yeah. You, know, you dig what I'm saying? Yep, yep. So it's going to be an interesting project. I mean, not many of us are left. There's like Tom Paxton, Bob Dylan, and John Sebastian. I was around. Most people are gone. Now, you soon after, you wound up in Boston, which was the scene of another a, a great folk scene. How did that compare to New York? Well, I had a hard time there because they, do, they weren't too keen on singer-songwriters. They were very much into authentic uh, ethnic music. Mm -hmm. Even if you were a college kid and you were wearing a Brooks Brothers shirt, you know, wearing a, uh, you know, a, 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 a button-down collar shirt, as long as you could play the blues, just like John Hurt. Even if you have no, it was like it was like folk music by rote. Uh -huh. We 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 were more of a uh, the songwriting thing was more of a, a pliable, like more, you know. It, it was a little more incendiary because it was dealing with bigger issues of happening now in the time, not things from the past. Talking about, you know, protesting all kinds of things were going on. War, civil rights was happening. I didn't wasn't so much into it. Or like, you know, a lot of love things happening, psychological stuff. It was uh, dealing with any sub no, su no subject was taboo. Mm. I spoke with uh, Jeff Maldow recently, and he, he said the New York scene was a lot more commercial than, than Boston. Would you say that? Well, the, the Boston wasn't a songwriter scene. I don't know exactly what he's referring to, but he could be right. I mean, you know, people like John Sebastian, who had a jug band, he, it wasn't long before he formed a Love and Spoonful. Yeah, that's right. And they were pretty popular in Boston. I mean, Boston looked the other way to this when it, when it came to famous people. They all were, like, turned out to be groupies, you know? Mm-hmm. There was, there was a little, there was a little, Boston people were afraid of New York in one way. Yeah. You know, every, every, I don't know why people are afraid of New York. They shouldn't be because it's a built of just immigrants. They're just pouring in every day. I, I got picked up by an Egyptian doctor the other day in a cab. <laughs> he can't practice because he doesn't have his license here. Just driving cabs for a living. Yeah, for wow. now. Could you sense a time when that great folk revival 
for want of a better name, uh, of the 60s was starting to, to fade away. Could, could you see that coming? I think... Um I think I I mean it remember I wasn't some I mean I would cross paths with these folk revival people of course and I remember I said two years I didn't work I just was listening you know just eating you know just eating it up in clubs in dark clubs just listening but um I, it might have uh, dissipated you know somewhat uh, like folk rock came along things mm -hmm. like that um Remember, people like myself, or say, I know um, Bob and Dylan and uh, Phillips, we grew up on rock and roll. We learned our, how to play Anderson's with early, like, you know, Little Richard, Elvis Presley, and um, Buddy Holly, people like that, Chuck Berry. Some of the other guys, people, they probably learned from Cisco Houston and Woody Guthrie. You know, they learned just the, the, the prim proper acoustic music, three chord thing, but I, or, or blues. But I mean, we, I learned from rock and roll. So, I mean, it was, not, it was kind of an evolution. You know, it wasn't long before, you know, drums came back and guitars, you know, things. Mm. That's what we grew, learned from. That was basically the full turn. Some of us, not all of us, but some. Um, yeah. Something interesting I didn't know, which I found out reading about you the other day, that you're on the verge of being signed by Brian Epstein, the, the Beatles manager, just before That's he... correct. Yeah. He came and found me in a little dark club in New York, and they told me, and it reminded Bobby Columbia, the drummer for Blood, Sweat and Tears, told me that uh, it reminded him of the Beatles in, in, the, in Liverpool. You know, this little dingy club mm -hmm. in the basement. He came every night, and, hey, and, he wanted, and then he wor started working with me. And uh, very sadly, he died. And I'll tell you something that's very ironic. And uh, the way I found out was um, at a at a folk festival in Philadelphia. An announcement by a folk archivist. I, I, don't know, I mean, a folk. Uh, oh, a guy who you know really studied a folk anthropologist, practically Ken Goldstein. You know, worked with the blues, worked with folkways. You know, uh, you know, studying American music like Alan John Lomax. He, he he got up on stage with glee to announce, and this is how I found out about Brian. I was talking to John Denver, actually, by, in the mud somewhere, by a fence, and he, with, with you know, with, with malicious glee, got up on stage saying Brian Epstein had died, and everybody applauded <sighs> because he managed the Beatles, and Brian Epstein never did anything for folk music. Right. I mean, so I, I was a little pissed off. It was a little uncharitable, you know. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he was great. Did Brian, before he died, have time to to convey to you what what plans he had for your career? He he put it real simply. He said, "Look, man, if you trust me, if just do what you do." He never tried to. He just loved what I did. Don't change it. Keep doing it. Keep working. Evolve. And if you don't mind, he said, "Once in a while, I will put you certain places, mm -hmm. certain presentations or venues." And that's all there was to it. That's as far as it got. Right. You had some tapes mysteriously lost. The master tapes of, of the album of Stages in the early 70s. How big a setback was that to you at the time? Well, I think it was a pretty big setback because it, it rolled back the momentum of this album I did called Blue River. And um, we went ahead with an album and nobody knew if it was quite finished. But what happened, there was a big, there was a huge political corporate upheaval. The, so, uh, Columbia Records and all that. Yeah. The, 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 the company capsized when the Federal Bureau of Investigation came in, and they uh, uh, for you know payola scandals, drugs, all this prostitutes, all these things, and uh, they uh, they came in and raided the place. And and the president Clive Davis got fired. He started. He he got his revenge at, at Arista Records. So everybody associated with me kind of was shaking in their boots because Clive brought me into the label. And they dumped my record, basically, because they were—they they didn't care about an unfinished record. They just cared about their jobs. The tapes, of course, turned up many years later. They were lost purposely. They were lost purposely. You did yeah. find that out. Yeah. Right. I found out because of the way they were found. They were they showed up mysteriously when they put a dragnet in the world, you know, when they started this legacy record, you know, to reissue Robert Johnson. Ah, oh, yes. Yep. And eventually they reissued the Dylan things into Albert Hall and, you know, the same label, Miles Davis. Well, they redid my albums, my one, <clears throat> put a search all over the world and everybody got scared and somebody, they, they it flushed the tapes out of Nashville where I recorded it. Uh -huh. So they were hidden, lost like on purpose. 
been many, many covers of your songs over the years by other artists. Who was some of the standouts for you? Well, I never really liked that much covers of my songs. Um, I, John Denver did a nice job on a song called Thirsty Boots, and Rick Nelson did a nice job on a song called Violets of Dawn. Um, Judy Collins. Did, I mean, they, you know, they're okay. They're good. But they always sound different when you hear other people doing it. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't sound the same. But it's nice, of course. I think some Australian group did a kind of a new wave version of a song called Violets of Dawn, but I never heard it. All right, I must look out for that. That's sure. <laughs> Where are you located, by the way, man? Melbourne. Where you? Hmm? Melbourne, okay. Yeah. Melbourne. What? You know, this, I'm very appreciative that you took interest in me because I, in 40 years I've never talked to one Australian in my life. Is that correct? No. Oh, that's amazing. What what prompted your your relocation to Norway? A woman. Uh huh. That'll do it, wouldn't it? But I mean, I'm mostly in New York. Mm hmm. So I'm just there. You know, I have my have kids there, and I I'm there. You know, I'm in and out. So you kind of divide your time between the two. Yeah, I'm, I'm traveling. I'm to a lot of places. I don't. I'm not. I've been really traveling quite a bit. Does that become a problem sometimes conducting business with with sort of two home bases as it is? Oh, it's not even more than two. I mean, I spent two months in Italy working on a book I'm writing last year. I uh, I'm just. I don't even. I've got a line on my sign. I don't even know where where is anymore. <laughs> <laughs> From a song called "Salt on Your Skin." Oh, I was crazy. I was in Italy. I won this movie, this music prize about three weeks ago with Patti Smith in Italy. Mm -hmm. Flew all day. I had breakfast in Italy, lunch in Paris, and dinner in Boston. And the next day, I did a, a thing at the Museum of uh, Fine Arts with Lawrence Ferlinghetti. You know the poet. Yep. We did a show together, and I did my, my entire album, Beat Avenue. I did not the album, but I did the whole piece, uh, the long set to teeth. Performed it. It was the second time I've ever done it. So we had a great sold-out show. And I mean, and then two days later, I was in Zurich starting a tour. So, I mean, you don't even know. I mean, you're. It, it's like you... It's a very strange sensation because you don't know. I mean, everything's kind of vaguely familiar, and you're sleeping, sleepwalking through airports, talking to people you know. But you, like, it's, it's very, it's weird when you're moving so fast. Yeah, it has been very fast this last year. There was a long period of time up until um, Ghost Upon the Road where there was no. Mainly, your records were only being released in Europe. Was that by choice? They were they were released in Europe. Well, I did. I, I got a record deal in Norway for an album called Midnight Sun, and they did release it all through Europe and Japan. I don't know about Australia. They, um, they weren't being released back home in the states, though, were they? No, they weren't. No, it's Columbia. They wouldn't pick it up. Is that right? Yeah. Hey, you know, man, I'll tell you something. You know, I have you heard this song Beat Avenue? No, I haven't. But I was going to discuss it with you shortly. Yeah. Well, it, it, when you hear it, you'll understand. I got calls for long interviews from Norway, from the Toronto Globe and Mail, which is a national paper. It's not Toronto. It's called the Globe and Mail. Mm -hmm. And also uh, from different, you know, pay, but not, no, but no Americans. Really? And um, it's kind of weird because of the song. We thought something would happen, but it hasn't yet. So America, that my album wasn't released here, it's not. It's not always so surprising because <laughs> they're the least to care about, you know, all, all things. But um, the, but about sixty radio stations have played the song. It's twenty six minute song in the states and Canada, including the biggest, the biggest like acoustic, you know, pop folk station in New York City has played it already three times. And that's a that's a big tall order for a song that long. It's like I think it's longer than Inagata De Vita. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it took you about fifteen years to write. Is that right? Pardon me. It took you about fifteen years to write it. Is that correct? No, I wrote it in the eighties, um, and I but I never had an outlet. I, I I never had any place to record it because it was so long. So it just sat there. And I worked on it a little bit more, a little here, a little there. And then the record company gave me, said, look, man, just, we'll give you the, give, just, it should have its own CD. Uh -huh. Which is a pretty ballsy thing to do because, you know, record companies, they're so paranoid about business and money, they don't dare do double CDs for anybody. Mm. 
I mean, they don't even do a double, that long movie for a Kill Bill, you know, for a Tarantino. They have to divide it into two. They're, they're scared. Unless it's, it's unless it's like the best, the best, you know, like box sets, they'll do them. Or, you know, Miles Davis or the best of, of um, you know, you know, um, you know, you know, artists where they're like box sets or like two, you know, compilations and stuff. You probably noticed that. Yeah, obviously a great advantage working with a, with a label like Appleseed, who are sort of a specialist label as such. Mm. Yeah, Columbia wouldn't do that. No, Sony they wouldn't do that. No, they wouldn't do that. No major label would do it. I wouldn't think. Mm-mm. Or a, and small labels would never do it. When you began writing that song all those years ago, Beat Avenue, did you know then that it was going to develop in, into such a, a a huge project as it did? Well, I, I knew it was long, but I, I didn't know where to put it. Uh, it was an interesting kind of thing. I think, you know, I had written, it was around the time I wrote, it was a companion piece to the song Ghost Upon the Road. Well, you've heard that? Yes, yeah. Which was a 12-minute recitative, you know, spoken narrative thing, telling a tale. And uh, I think around that time, I was reading a lot of James Joyce, you know, the Irish writer. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, you had that book Ulysses, which was like a whole 900 page book about one day in Dublin, June, June 16th, 1904, whenever it was. Could be wrong about the dates. But you know, where you take, you just you take the day, and then you can, then you can, rem, you can, then you can, you can uh, ruminate, reminisce, you can, you know, um, um, you, you can meander and wander through different times just but using that day as like the skeleton of a story yeah so that's what I did with uh, this Pete Avenue and it evolved I th- when I did it in the museum I came back from Italy I rewrote one third of the song for the performance right there in the hotel room because the, there was a few things I thought I could maybe iron out and explain a little better for a, for a live reading and it turned out great I was just lucky and we got like a standing ovation Fantastic. I couldn't believe that many people would be interested in this. <laughs> How come you don't have a copy? What's wrong with the companies down there? Uh, look, I've hunted around for it, but I uh, haven't been able to come across it, but Carol is sending one down. But aren't you, I mean, for, as a radio station, shouldn't the company, the, is it released? Local release? I couldn't even tell you that. I don't think it is, to be perfectly honest. No, okay. I, might, I might get on to Appleseed and just see who, who their Australian distributor is. I think it's, uh, is it festive? Is it... Is there a festival record? Yes, there is. Yeah, it might be through festival. I might just give them a, a call. Distributor? Yeah. Well, that's terrible if you're doing it, if you take all this time and interest to do a thing on, on me so far away, that uh, they should be jumping up and down to get your material. Uh, yeah, some record companies, Danny, you've actually got to beg to, to get uh, material sent to you. Huh. This is a real shame. What, what is this for, if you don't mind me asking? For uh, public radio. Oh, the public radio. Yeah. Okay. I think this is the first uh, um, thing I've ever done in Australia. I don't know why. Everyone loves it down there. Everybody tells me it's so great. They want to go. My daughter's going to Australia for a couple of months. Is she really? Uh, from Norway, yeah. With her friend. Her friend studies nursing there. Okay. Sydney. And everybody loves Australia. <laughs> I mean, it's un- it must be, su- must be the water or something. <laughs> I don't know, man. I've never been there. I'd love to go. Oh, look, we'd love to have you down. There's a fantastic festival season down here in the in the first half of the year, which um, there'd be plenty of places for you to play. That's for sure. How do you? Who do you talk to? I might have to send you some contacts. I think. Do you know some people? I can send you some names. Yeah. Would you really? Yep, I can do that. Would you? You want to? Uh, I mean, do you, would you send them by email? To yeah, I'll, I'll email them to Carol if you like. That would be great. Yeah. Because I mean, maybe some people would be listening to this show. Yeah, I want to talk about the the trio albums you did with Rick Danko and and Jonas and Jonas Feld. Mm-hmm. How do you look back on those now? That that must have been a fantastic side project for you. Well, that was a beautiful thing because it was, we loved harmonies, you know. Um, and you know, a lot of singer songwriters they work pretty they're pretty lone wolves, you know. Yeah. And uh, it was a great thing. And Rick was a, a, a literally a band guy in one of the great harmonies. And they said. You know, there's a thing saying when Rick when Rick Danko was born, the you know, and the angels sang. Mm-hmm. He sang harmony. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he was one of the greatest harmonies in the world. I was just, I mean, Bob Dylan loved this record that we did. He wanted to be on the he wanted to be on the next album. Did he really? 
And we're, I'm talk, we're talking now about having to do this maybe 60s thing, you know, to do it because you love the way we did it with trading the verses and with Rick and everything, the harmonies. So maybe you, you might, we're talking to his office about doing this next album with me. And, you know, the same idea where you're trading off verses and stuff. Yeah. He loved that stuff. Uh, it was one of his favorite records, the first album. He liked them both a lot. But it was a wonderful experience, and uh, I, I learned that, you know, you learn a band dynamic, you know, it's a whole thing you learn about, you know, how to get along, egos, and art, and, you know, uh, how to make, get a, it's chemistry, you know, and this was real, this was a genuine chemistry, and it was beautiful. Have you heard any of it? I've got them both, yeah, the fantastic records. So, um, you know, Rick was very proud of me, won a lot of awards, and, you know, it was quite a great thing. I miss him terribly. I work with Garth a lot, you know, Garth Hudson. Mm -hmm. So Garth played on the last record, didn't he? Yeah, we yeah. just did a gig in Woodstock. Me, Garth, and this guy, Happy Traum. Yes. We did a great show in Woodstock, in one of the theaters there. And uh, Garth, uh, we worked in Toronto for this Toronto Film Festival gig thing we were doing for a movie called Festival Express. That was about a train express, a festival that traveled by train in 1970. They they rented a whole uh, train. Across Canada, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Nice job yeah. on the band and uh, um, a buddy guy. And I was like the only acoustic artist on the tour. It's going to be out, I guess, in the theaters or it definitely will be on DVD coming out. It's a great, it's amazing. It was an Fantastic. amazing event. I have, yeah, I have heard about it. It's supposed to be brilliant. That, that, that so Garth cool. and I did a show up there for in conjunction with that in Toronto. We just sold out show. Yeah, maybe I should bring Garth down to down under. Why not? Yeah. People, I think there are a lot of band fans down there, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. They were, they were huge. Down here. They did come down here in the... When they reformed in the 80s, they uh, did a tour down here. Yeah, Rick told me that. Yeah. Well, they loved Australia, that's for sure. Everyone I've talked to. Has, um, has your songwriting method or... They like music down there. People, they just love the music. So everybody tells me. We'll have to get I'm to sorry. Dan. We'll have to get to Dan here to find out for yourself and, and just say, yeah. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> has your songwriting procedure or your method of songwriting changed much over the years, the way you actually sit down and go about it? Well, I think it's changing. I mean, every time you write a song, it's a surprise. That's part. That's why I love it so much, because you don't know when you you, when you put the pen down to paper, you don't know where it's going to end. It's like closing your eyes and taking a pencil and doing a doodle. You don't know where it's going to end. That's mm -hmm. the thrill of it, the surprise. And that goes along with, you know, because I'm, I'm a firm believer that uh, thinking is the antichrist of art. Mm -hmm. I, I believe you know you're kind of a receiver you're like a medium you know you're kind of your your litmus paper or something you just put your finger in the air and something's gonna stick and uh, so you, you don't know how big the song will be how small whether it'll have rhymes you know that's the that's the fun of it you know it's the exploration angle that yeah. I love about writing and I think that's true of any kind of writing you know poetry or, or you know I'm writing a book of novellas you know and I don't know how it's exactly going to end but it's fun getting there journey hmm? it's a the, journey the journey of it yeah that's yeah. what I love. I mean, that's that, that's really exciting because it's different than to performing because you can do a little different version each night of a but it's the same song. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And um, it's great and everything. You can try it this way, try to color it this way, a little yellow, try it a little blue. But I mean, but with writing, you don't know what's you know where you're going to end up. It's like each, each it, it's a, it's the Amazon every time. <laughs> 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 trying to find the source of the Nile or something, you know, yeah. it's, in a small way, you know. I read that you're not not comfortable being labelled as a folk singer. Do you think there's a tendency for people to be too quick to, to want to categorise artists without listening to the broader scope of what, well, what they can do? Well, you categorise me that way, and, and I I, I kind of took I took I, I bristled a little after so many years. I'll tell you why because they don't call most uh, singer songwriters uh, folk singers. They call them singer songwriters or artists or whatever. Because I mean, these people really are more folk singers than me. Because I mean, how many people? Folk singers have worked with like Howie Epstein and Ben Montage from the from the Tom Penny and the Heartbreakers, mm. and an album partially produced by Tom. You know, people those people, or worked with Rick Danko and Garth Hudson, or Richard Thompson, or Johnny Mitchell, or people like that. You know, yeah. I mean, why me? That's it's it's just an inaccurate portrayal, depiction of who I am. Mm. It's limiting. You know, it's uh, not true. 
I don't sing folk songs. And if I was in front of a Chinese firing squad, I wouldn't be able to maybe know two folk songs like I should. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be uh, working some shows. I'm uh, working on this book. Um, we're working on some video and film projects. Just projects and events. Mm -hmm. uh, some shows next year. Probably I'm going to be doing a probably a, a pretty big tour of Europe next fall. I'll have a new album out. Of course, the '60s. You know, this thing I was telling you about. Yep. Um, the '60s songbook thing. And um, I'm not quite sure. That's part of the fun, the adventure. You don't know quite what's going to come up. But uh, there's a lot of things uh, we're thinking about. I, you know, it's one life is not enough. Yeah. <laughs> We'll see what we can do about uh, getting an Australian visiting. Well, that. get me down there. I'd like yeah. to get down. I want to meet. I want to. I want to. I want to. I want to have a. I want to have a. I want to play cards with a king brown snake. <laughs> I want to eye to eye and see who blinks first. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks a lot for your time, Eric. It's been uh, a treat to uh, catch up with you. I feel quite honoured to be the well, first Australian to interview you. I, it's an honour and a privilege and a pleasure to have done an interview with you. And <laughs> my very first. I'm, I was a virgin man until today. <laughs> I'd like to t turn you over to uh, Carol. Absolutely. Just for yeah. one moment. But Not a thank problem. you very much, and uh, please send some information. Anything you could do to get us uh, down there, you know, to give us some information, I certainly would uh, appreciate. Before I die, I'd love to do a little tour down there. Okay. I will certainly do that. As soon as I get home, I'll send something down. Will you do that? Thanks so much. Great to talk to you. You too, Eric. Okay, here she is. Bye-bye.